Well, this is the last of six videos on characterization of organic molecules. We're going to focus just on mass spectrometry. We're going to talk just a little bit about how it works and how we interpret mass spectra. So let me just get right into it. We've already covered the methods involving light. This is a method that the, the method of analysis of molecules that does not involve light. So how does it work? Well, we really have sort of three regions, the ionization chamber, I guess the separation chamber or stage, and the detection. So we have to introduce sample as a gas and in a, I guess, a gas phase, ionize it. And how do we do that? Well, one of the older methods of ionizing a molecule, or balls here are the molecules, is just to take a potential, a very strong voltage across this gap, and force electrons to jump across this gap. Of course they're going to have a, hot, a lot of energy. What they're going to do is they're going to knock these molecules around, bam, you know, wham, and they can knock off these electrons uh, off the molecule. So the molecule going through that field becomes positively charged. Now we know from, I guess, uh, physics that if a charge is moving it creates a magnetic field. And So as this charge goes into the separation chamber we can have the magnetic field of the charge interacting interacting with the big magnetic field and it can bend the particles direction of travel that's pretty cool and you can use other methods uh, quadrupole technology is not represented here but you have to have a big magnet in the second st stage so this is an ionization chamber of course we need it to go to a positive cation we can have softer methods of this ionization that are more popular why? Because they limit the amount of fragmentation that can also occur. These guys are getting bombarded, uh, hit it with a lot of energy. We can have ionization, which we want, the ball with just a plus charge, minus an electron. But the ball can start to fall apart. The molecule can fall apart with all that energy. So we can have in the ionization chamber both ionization and fragmentation. The separation, we're going to assume that for most cases, or for most particles traveling through that are charged, they're going to have a plus one charge, just one positive charge. And that charge, or mass to charge ratio, is what sets how much they bend. If the mass is very high, mass to charge, they're not going to bend as much. But if the mass, again assuming just a plus one charge is light, it would bend a lot. So we can have maybe a dually three-quarter ton truck and a Fiat. The particle that comes through with a positive charge will bend more if it's light and will bend less if it's heavy. So this is in the separation chamber or region of the MS. And we, of course, keyword is separating based on their, really the mass. We're assuming most of the things going through are going to have a plus one charge. And last, of course, the detector. We can look at where they fall in this bending process and detect that so we can have something in plate that catches those charges and then we see that charge and detect it. So that's how it works basically. Ionization, separation, and detection. So what can we do with it? Well there's kind of three things and I've already put some notes on these uh, three things that we can do. We can have one, the most expensive but very powerful method of analysis do high resolution mass spectrometry. It requires more sensitivity, more precision, but if we can exactly determine the mass for the molecule minus an electron, so there's no, been no fragmentation, that's where it works best, where we have the parent peak or what's called the molecular ion. These are sort of interchangeable. Molecular, molecular ion generates the parent peak in the mass spectra. What is the molecular ion? It's the molecule minus an electron, therefore a ion. It's molecule ion. Molecule minus an electron. This molecular ion generates the parent peak. That's typically where you do this mass determination, this absolute mass determination. Again, assuming a plus one charge, we can do this. We can take n heptane, run it, and we get a mz value, mass to charge ratio, of exactly 100.1253. And it falls just a you know fairly close, but a little different from where this ester would fall. So we could resolve these two, even though they have the same general M, uh, mass, 100. They have a very different mass going to figures beyond the decimal point. 
so we can do what's called absolute mass determination. Now we don't, the instrument doesn't tell us it's this molecule, but it gives us the exact molecular formula. Of course, the exact molecular formula for this would not match the mo exact molecular formula for this, so we can start to narrow things down. That's the first one. The second is isotopic cluster analysis. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this outside of some sort of important ratios. Around the parent peak again, where the molecule has just lost an electron, we typically do this analysis, and we can see sometimes uh, I guess uh, ratios between what's the parent peak the M plus peak, and some smaller peaks that come into the high mass side or the high MZ value side of this parent peak, what we call the M plus 2 peak, um, we're meaning, meaning not charge, but plus 2, I guess, neutrons as weight has gone up, M plus 2 peak, so plus one more MZ value. So the ratio of those two can sometimes tell us something about the, ra the um, presence of certain ions. It can also tell us the number of um, carbons that are, or, sorry, number of, um, yeah, number of carbons that are present within a sample. The M plus one to M plus peak. So we can have M plus two peak to M plus, or we can have M plus one to M plus peak. It'll sometimes tell us the number of carbons within the structure or number the presence of chlorines or bromines or things like that. So I'm not going to say a lot about this. Your books, might, your textbooks may talk about this a little bit more. But we can do some what is called isotopic cluster analysis. Looking at M plus peaks, M plus two peaks, or we could have look, even looked at the M plus one peak, which would be right here. Just an example of that. This is the only one I'll show. So we said the Cl35 is more um, prevalent as an isotope than the Cl37. It's favored 3 to 1. So we can, if we know we have chlorine, we can go to the parent peak region where the molecular ion shows up and expect a 3 to 1 ratio of the M plus to the M plus 2 peak. We can do the same thing for bromine. If we know we have it present or think we have bromine present, we can look for in the M plus to M plus 2 peak, we can look for a 1 to 1 ratio. Uh, one last thing, if we uh, want to look for the nitrogen, we can find an, sometimes an odd number. If we have an odd number of nitrogens, we can find an odd number for the MZ value of our parent peak. Molecules with an odd number of nitrogens has an odd M plus or molecular ion peak. So there's a lot more that can be said about isotopic cluster analysis. You may want to check out on your own in a textbook. But this is, um, I apologize, referencing a figure for uh, no book. But uh, this is just a sort of a very cursory glance at isotopic cluster analysis. I want to end with mass spectrometry in terms of discussing ionization, or sorry, fragmentation patterns. How can we predict how something will fall apart. Each of these have looked at one and two, really the parent peak, close clusters around the parent peak, exact determination of the mass for the parent peak. Now we're going to break, look at fragmentation, how those, we said balls, would fall apart. We talked about those balls, how they would fall apart. How can we predict that? So let's look at one example here, and then we'll have a second one and we'll be done. So we could take 2 methyl propane with a molecular weight roughly of 72 and propose how after ionization, an electron going free, so we're just going to represent that, and it's not accurate to say it's the electron from this C-C bond. So you, most of your textbooks will just say a radical charge, radical, radical with positive charge for the molecule, but we'll show it as being in that, in that bond there. So we'll say a positive charge for this molecule because we've lost an electron, let's say, from this bond. Again, that's maybe a little inaccurate. So what we can have then, this, this radical cation is a lot of instability. Of course, we've already added a lot of energy, and a radical is unstable, and a cation can be unstable. So we can have this, this thing fall apart, fragment, where a radical goes free separate from what's going to be left over 
the cation. So it's sort of separating the radical from the cation. That's fragmentation. Typically the radical of the radical cation goes free in some form and we'll have to propose what type of radical is generated typically by looking at what cation is most favored. This is the key. Looking at the cation that would be most favored from this 2,2-dimethylpropane. Well the most favored cation would be formed if we severed off a methyl group with radical and left a positive charge on a tertiary carbon because a tertiary carbocation, just CC, is most stable of, uh, I guess, positive charges on carbons and considering induct inductive effects, we'd like to have it tertiary instead of secondary or primary. So we would expect, when we look at the signal or the mass spectra for 2,2-dimethylpropane, if there is fragmentation, it'll favor that type where we kick off 15 MZs. 12 for the carbon, 3 for the hydrogen, we'd expect minus 15 MZs down from the parent peak, 72, we'd expect that ion, that tert butyl cation. And sure enough, we see that in the spectra, the mass spectra, for this neopentane or 2,2-dimethylpropane. We can do that for other structures. Um, again, we don't see the parent peak here because this is so favored, I shouldn't say again, but we see because this is such a favored fragmentation, um, it's going to cause complete fragmentation in some cases, not all, but in this particular mass spectra, there is no parent peak. The mo molecule in the ionization chamber is not just ionized, but has completely fragmented to this tert butyl cation. So let's look at one more and uh, we'll be done. So let's take on uh, this structure. We have just hexane, one, two, three, four, five, six, and we ionize it. And again, I in this case, I did not show where we're ion breaking off an electron. So we just show it as a radical cation. But this can fragment in a way that's a little different. We can't create a tertiary carbocation. So the best we can do is create primary carbocations. We can break this off and have a methyl radical, or we can break here and have a ethyl radical and a primary carbocation. It really doesn't change the stability of the cation. If we break here, we would have a positive charge on a primary position, or if we break here, and put the positive charge on a primary position. There's no difference. So when there's no difference in the types of fragments you'd have considering the cation, try to consider fragmentation wherein you stabilize the radical. And whatever's good for a cation is good for a radical. So we'd rather have a radical on a, I guess, a primary position than on just a methyl position. CH3 radical is not as stable as an ethyl radical, just as a CH3 cation would not be as stable as an ethyl cation. So we, we tend to favor, as far as fragmentation, the kicking off of not minus 15, but mi now minus 29 MZs down from the parent peak. Now in this case, we still have the molecular ion or parent peak. We still have it, still present. Some of it gets through the ionization chamber and makes it out alive. So the molecular ion, M plus, is the molecular ion. It's at 86. It represents the weight of the molecule, just minus an electron. But we have minus 29 MZs down from that. We see our, and I guess should define what base peak is, that's just our highest peak. Highest peak is always called the base peak. That base peak represents the fragment that's generated here, the butyl cation not the radical, we don't see that in the map, but we just know that that's what's kicked off to generate this butyl cation. This is our fragmentation peak, not our molecular ion peak. That is representing the butyl cation because it's a favored cation formed considering the favored radical that would be generated along with it. If we had just kicked off a methyl group, 
we'd have a methyl radical that may not be its favorite. We see a little bit of that here, but minus 29 is fragmentation. Minus 29 MZs as a fragmentation is favored. All right, we can do the same thing with other types of functional groups. We can have, this is uh, where we'll end, we can take an alcohol, kick off an electron to make a radical cation, and we can have the loss of a methyl group to create initially, I'm going to go ahead and draw the resonance form for this, to initially create the following cation from this. We can kick off that methyl group CH3 to take the radical, the dot, and leave a positive charge here. Still having one methyl group off it, this one on the dash. But we know by resonance, by resonance, we can stabilize the positive charge if it's next to the oxygen. So that ten, tends to be where we see fragmentation, either of minus 15 MZs down from the parent peak for this, so 102 minus 15, 87. Or we could actually kick off the propyl group as a radical and have minus, I guess, uh, 29, uh, 43 MZs down from 102 to 59. So with alcohols, just think, I'm always going to be considering as fragmentations, loss of a carbon off of the carbon that that OH group is connected to. That's going to give me this cation that has resonance delocalization. Same thing for carbonyls. Think next to the carbon that's bonded to the oxygen. I can lose those alkyl groups because, and if we wanted to draw what maybe looks more like this, you could say I have, in that case, a positive charge next to this oxygen. He can come down and by resonance stabilize that positive charge. So you can see a minus 15 mz value for this phenyl methyl ketone. But that's it for mass spectrometry looking at um, just um, the three things we can do with it as a focus. Didn't talk too much about these two, just a little, but focused in on fragmentation patterns that you need to be able to predict for mass spectrometry. Look for the carbocation that would be most stable if you were to blow the structure apart. We talked about neopentane. We'd start looking towards quaternary sites because if we'd lost an alkyl group, we'd have a tertiary carbocation. And we looked at alcohols and carbonyls and how they would for favor putting the positive charge next to these oxygens that have lone pairs that can come down and satisfy the positive charge. Bye-bye.